11th season at his alma mater, making their second NCAA tournament appearance. As a Princeton player, he earned second-team All-Ivy League honors in 1998. This season, the Tigers 23 and 8 overall, 10 and 4 in conference play. As a 15 seed, they did shock the two Arizona. Then they followed that up by beating Missouri. They've got Creighton coming up on Friday. Mitch Henderson is my guest. Mitch, it is great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you? Mitch, I'm awesome. It's great to talk to you. Really appreciate it. So let me ask you this. you lead Princeton to the Sweet 16. The school has never been there before. You're just the fourth 15 seed to get to the round of 16. Does it feel pretty normal and legit, or does it really feel incredibly surreal and a little crazy? Uh, uh, the second part, we, um, I'm calling you from the bus on the way to Philadelphia. We just left our campus after practice, and we're on our way to Louisville. And, you know, there's a thousand plus I mean, Alumni, fans, students, professors cheering us on, and uh, we're we're pinching ourselves. Of course, I, I actually think we're playing really great basketball, and I'm psyched about our opportunities. But uh, this is it's a really special moment here, and uh, I got I got to tell you. So um, one of my favorite moments in my life. This is my second time on your show. Uh, 1998. I called in. We spoke. We were a five seed, and I got some great jungle karma going into the first round of the NCAA tournament when I was a student. And I had, it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had talking to you. So I'm glad to be with you again. My man, you telling that story is one of the cooler things that's happened to me in quite some time. I actually (laughs) love that, Mitch. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's incredible. I got, I I got, I love it. I tell everybody this story. I I hope that, sorry to interrupt you. I just, it's so fun for me because we were a five seed and you started off and you were like, how in the world did you guys get a five seed? And I started to tell some story about how Carl and Malone's Louisiana Tech team got a, you know, a six seed, and they were similar to us. And you were like, "Holy cow! I stand corrected." It was great. I, I was so happy. Yeah, I, I, I've never been so. Now. Yeah, Mitch, <laughs> it's a great story. And although I don't enjoy being wrong, I've never been so happy to be wrong. <laughs> so that really was well, awesome. I, I mean, it really is amazing. Let me ask you, since we're talking about your playing days also at Princeton, your legendary coach, Pete Carrillo, passed away in August. He was mm-hmm. such a transcendent figure in the college game. Can you even put into words how he helped to shape you as a person and the coach that you are right now? Yes, I, I can. And it's... You know, when you're when you're deciding in the recruiting process where to go to school, I mean, I, I remember distinctly I wanted to play at Indiana or Butler. I'm from Indiana, and I had been getting recruited by you know some of the Ivies, Princeton being one of them. And my dad was like, "Where do you want to go to school?" And and I started to talk through it, and I st- I got to Princeton. He goes, "Okay, let's stop right there." And you know, you, you go you go out there. So you first you sort of need your parents to sort of push you in that direction sometimes, and then you meet Coach Carroll, who taught basketball, Jim, really as a metaphor for life. Um, you know, he was in the Hall of Fame uh, the first year he retired, but, you know, he's a very decorated coach, but, you know, never made a Final Four and, like, you know, didn't win a national championship, but really was transcendent in his own way. Four guys playing around a skilled post, uh, what, very much of what you see now with the modern game. He was obsessed with Bill Russell's um, effect on the game. He always said that no one affected the game or did as many things to make their team win as Russell. So, you know, and then, and then there's the way he talked. You know, this, uh, he was very direct, very difficult to play for in some ways because he was so direct, but saw the game so fast and quickly. And he's influenced me so much that it's hard to know where his thoughts start and mine start, kind of, if that makes sense. So I'm a uh, – um, we're honoring him this season. We have a bow tie on our uniforms, which honor Coach Carrillo. And uh, we're, we're psyched to be in the Sweet 16. I know he's watching. No, that does make sense. And I appreciate that response a lot. In fact, Mitch Henderson is my guest. You know, what's really interesting, you said when I said, is it surreal, is it wild? You said, yes, it's all those things. But you also said, I'm really excited by how well we're playing. Like, as an example, that Arizona win is going to live forever in Princeton lore. And you see something like that. But, Mitch, how many times have we seen a team pull a massive upset only to fall flat and even get blown out yeah. in the next round? What's it say about your group that it kept its head and it beat a quality opponent in Missouri in the second round to get to the second weekend? I appreciate this question very much because it allows me to say that what we I'm tried to identify years ago uh, what it's going to take to win two games in the tournament. And I, I got fortune of uh, – Good fortune to be an assistant in the Big Ten, and you know, Bo Ryan, Wisconsin teams, and the Izzo, 
Michigan State teams, to me, I always they weren't always perfect, but they just made it all the time. They advanced two games, you know. So it's rebounding and defense. So we out-rebounded Arizona, got more points in the paint. We out-rebounded Missouri, more points in the paint, took more free throws, made more free throws. And that's been a long time in the making. And we've identified those kinds of guys in the recruiting process. And Princeton is a very attractive place for certain kids. And uh, we have a kid from San Diego. We have a kid coming in from Harvard-Westlake, which is right there in L.A. And uh, we, we, uh, we're shooting for the stars, and, and we're got, we've got great players that like to play physically. Mitch Henderson joining us. You kind of answered the question I was going to hit you with, but maybe you can elaborate on that. The Princeton brand already is world-renowned, so it's not like the university needed this additional exposure, but your run of the Sweet 16 may have caught the attention of some younger players who do have the grades and the game to come to the program. Effectively, what are you looking for when you recruit? What's the general profile of a Princeton student-athlete? So we, we first passed a wide net in terms of the grades, and then we – we lock in on what we think the top 20 student athletes are in the country. We're very direct in terms of what we're looking for and, um, and, and about what it's like here. We don't shy away from the rigor. You know, you are a, you're, we want you to be, have a world-class basketball experience and an unrivaled academic experience. And there are kids out there that like that. Now, of course, we're non-scholarship. Um, certain families, of course, get, a significant amount of aid, but, you know, you have to work with families on all those things. But then, you know, again, as you probably are well aware, like, I think the name of the game in college basketball these days is adaptability. And, you know, transfer portal, and I O, and you look at a place like ours, and, you, you know, over the years, and we couldn't point to a Sweet 16. You, know, you couldn't say, like, it was a relevant national moment that there is now. And uh, we're, we're, we're just... Um, this is going to be to give us a big bump in recruiting, and kids know that they can come to a place like this and increase their own personal brand, but while also not sacrificing anything academically or on the court. Princeton head coach Mitch Henderson on the bus with his team joining us. You know, Mitch, it's interesting. Like, you obviously can't hit the portal hard and look for that quick fix like a lot of other coaches can. But, but looking at the group that you have right now and how they've played together, worked together, and respond to each other, is that not an advantage? And especially this time of year. I, I actually think it is, and uh, I know this might seem, you know, it's not. This is this is very familiar for me, but you know, <laughs> I've got. A guy taking thermonuclear dynamics. I've got a guy taking Chinese. I've got you know, multiple economics majors, pre-meds. They learn and grow from one another, and that's what they sign up for. And then also, we're a 5,000 undergrad un- university. Well, over over a thousand of the students are athletes, so they're they're going to school with really like-minded and um, very high-achieving people that that are just like them. So you're just constantly raising the level as you're. Uh, on each team, and and I think the school has such incredible school spirit because of it. Because you know they they uh, they they help each other grow. If that makes sense. Absolutely, iron will always sharpen iron, and you always want to there, surround there yourself yes. with people who make it better or make you better. Yes. So, Mitch, you you've been here before. Well, not really. Like nobody's been there before. You got them there. Yeah. Players got them there. I'm curious. What about the experience? Like, I've got two really good friends in the media. <laughs> who played football at Princeton, Kyle Brandt, who worked on this show for years, yep. Ross Tucker, who introduced me to Kyle Brandt. I know that they're loving this run. Generally, what is your fan base like, and what does the experience mean to them? So Ross Tucker's doing our game on Friday. Um, he's, the, he's the radio guy, I think. And Ross Tucker sent me a message saying that our win over UCLA is a big reason why he went to Princeton. Now, that's what he told me. I hope that's true. But I will tell you that um, these sorts of moments, our fans in Sacramento were unreal. It was like they were in hysterics, jumping chokeholds. One, one, my, a cousin, a friend of mine, roommate of mine had one of my, my – I have a five-year-old son who was holding him upside down. <laughs> you know, right. and our, our fans are going to travel really well to Louisville. And as you know – those, those games, they put the fans in a section right near your bench, but there's a great access to the court, and, and those things matter. They matter a lot, neutral court. So I, I think that we, we take a lot of pride here in um, our sports, and basketball just happens to be one of those areas where you can make a major impact for the university. So I, I'm psyched, and 
Now, you mentioned the UCLA game way back in the day, or we, you know, I mean, I, I, as a player, yes, I had. I had a great experience, but nothing like this, Jim. This is a million times better. So you beat me to that. You already answered that question, but what about that game, Mitch? Mitch Henderson, my guest. What about that game? You were a member of that team that shocked UCLA in 96. What do you remember about that game, and what kind of thoughts do you have when you look back? So Coach would always say to us, Coach Carrillo would say in his own voice, I'm preparing you to win the game. <laughs> and he would, he, when the ball went up in the air, we, he goes, just run back on defense because you're not going to get it anyways. So we did. You know, the ball went up and all five guys ran back on D. I, I remember that, you know, they were the defending national champs and, and we played to win. It was a very low possession game. And I can't say it was the exact same framework against Arizona, but 59-55, we knew we had to keep them in check and transition. And so I draw on that game regularly and often. And then, and then you know, the – the impact that that game has had on myself and my teammates over the last 25, 27 years, it, it stands, I mean, there's not a week that goes by when somebody doesn't sort of say, like, oh, you were on that team. And you get into coaching, and it's all you want to is to, you know, again, be a great, you know, be great at what you're doing, of course, on the court, but also provide an experience for the students, athletes, that, that was similar to the one I got to have. And this one, this is special, and, and we're – and we want to keep it going. Yeah, and I know you're going to make sure that everybody knows that. So really quickly, <laughs> Greg McDermott, obviously, is a heck of a coach. He's got his team back in the Sweet 16. Second time in three years. As you look, Mitch, at the tape of Creighton, what stands out to you the most about the Blue Jays? They have a kid inside named Carl Brennan. He's unbelievable. 7-1. Um, he blocks so many shots around the rim without fouling. He's got a, a particularly unusual skill set that we have not seen. And then they've got a kid, Nemhard, who I just thought was unbelievable against Baylor, and among other great players. They are, at this point, I think, you know, the best, uh, the, you know, very talented team, but also great continuity. And, and, you know, I think at this point in the tournament, you start to see you know, your, your best isn't quite enough. And, and we know that we're going to have to be at our best. Um, but we'll also have to have great savvy and, and guts against some really good players and a really well-coached team. You're right about Greg. He's, he's got his team playing very well. Well, your, your group has proven that. It's got guts, it's got savvy, and no one's afraid of the big stage. And I think while it's a great story, let's not lose track of the fact this is a really, really nice team. Mitch, great to have you on. Obviously, it's been oh, a man. minute. Listen, but really good to talk to you, Mitch. Thanks so much. I, I appreciate it. Looking for some more jungle karma, Jim. Thank you very much. My man, you got it, Mitch. You got it. I don't control it, but if I did, I would say you got it.